Welcome. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Church of Perpetual Life. It is my great pleasure, indeed, to be here with you tonight. I have an interesting question to ask you, if I may. How many people are here for the very first time, never been in the building before? Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, Holy Calypso, you're all here for the first time? How did you get here? Your friend? Yes. How? How did you hear about our events? Friends, friends, friends. These are real friends because they want to save your life. That's wonderful. No, it's true, right? It's true. Absolutely. That's what we are all about here. This is Perpetual Life. Uh, so I welcome you all. My name is Neil. Neil Vandery. I am your officiator. I, am a, I have the credentials of a minister, but my title is officiator. This is not a Christian church, although I'm also a uh, chaplain at Unity in Venice. The fact of the matter is, um, I'm very proud of my uh, title officiator here. This is the only church of its kind in the whole world. You're going to learn a little bit about it tonight. I want to tell you about a suggested watching list, something I'm going to do new. I'm going to keep an eye open for interesting transhumanist movies and TV shows. There's a show on called Altered Carbon, a science fiction show on Netflix. It takes place in the distant future where some of the people in this dystopian future have their consciousness copied onto disks, which can allow the person to move from body to body in a sort of an uploading of the consciousness, a la the singularity in Ray Kurzweil. I watched, I watched the first episode, and I was horribly disappointed. The main ideas, well, I was horrified by the graphic violence, to tell you the truth. The, the, I don't like violence. Whenever I see it on TV, I just turn off the TV. I hear it on the radio. I just try to put the filter up against the, the we got enough violence. We don't need to be entertained by it. I don't know why Hollywood keeps doing this. But it is, I have to say that it does have a good deal of true science in science fiction form. If you hear of science fiction, you've got fantasy. And you have what real science fiction is, which is science-based fiction. Jules Verne. 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea foresaw 100 years in advance the use of submarine technology like we have today, a nuclear submarine. That's true science fiction. By the way, he also said 100 years before it happened that three men would go to the moon and they would take off from Florida. Pretty, pretty good, huh? That's Jules Verne. Well, Altered Carbon has the same element as Byrne had, real science, it just needs to do away with all that violence. So I don't think I'll be watching anymore, but I'll keep you posted. But I, for those of you who don't mind the violence, there you go. Another show is called Other Life. Just learned about this, so I'll report back to you about Other Life in May. May 6th, when we will be having our next service. So this is March. April, <coughs> nothing. First time we're going without anything in April because... March 6th is just around the corner. So March 6th, we are very, very happy to have May 6th. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate knowing that you're listening. Yes. So May 6th. Alex, give me a head count. This is, I think, we, uh, Bill, uh, uh, Dr. Andrews may have beaten Aubrey's record. We're going to find out here in a minute of, of attendance. But anyway, May 6th. May, is this Len? I'll be right with you. Uh, you're on my schedule. Just a minute. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So May 6th, Jose Cordero, world famous, life extension guy, is going to be here speaking. Don't miss it. Yeah, it's great. Definitely, definitely. But don't come here on April, the fourth Thursday in April. We're usually here the fourth Thursday of the month or the fourth Saturday, sometimes when we have to. We prefer the fourth Thursday nights. But here we go, May 6th. Okay, and then June 7th or 6th, it's something like that. We have a we have a, um, a panel of diet-oriented speakers. And I believe, I've been told, our friend from Hippocrates, Brian Clement, will be here on that event, as well as some other powerful speakers. Len, would you stand for me, please? This is the only guy that reads my texts and will call me about them. Thank you, Len. That's correct. Sunday. I appreciate you checking the calendar for me. This is the second time we'll be here. 
You know, church is usually on a Sunday, but in this case, it'll be Sunday afternoon, May 6th, and we'll give you more details. If you don't receive emails from me, please give your email to Deborah, and she'll be happy. There you stand, Deborah, my assistant. She'll be happy to take your email as you leave. Everybody loves Deborah. And also, if you want to receive texts, give your cell phone number to Deborah, and you will receive texts to be alerted about what's going on with our events. You're not going to get a lot of texts, one or two. That's all, just to let you know, hey, this is what's going on. All right. So what is the Church of Perpetual Life, and why are we a church and not a social club? You were very chatty just a minute ago. You were very mysterious. That's where you get people from. So I'll ask again. This is audience participation. Why is the Church of Perpetual Life a church and not just a club? No, 501. We're a church because we hold faith in humanity in finding a way to solve the problems of aging. It's not just a, a desire, it's a true faith. I believe, no, no, I know, I know that I have a real chance at living to be 200 years old and having the body and mind of a 30, 35-year-old man, right? Perpetual Life is the only supplemental science-based church in the world. We're not a Bible-based church. And although we are not a Christian church, we do have Christian and Jewish members. We have members that are Buddhists. We have members that are humanists and atheists. Where's Bob? I said he's coming. Ah, now you're in the back. Come earlier, you get a front seat. Do you mind if I say hi? There he is. Bob, former, former head of Flash. I'm glad to have him here. Atheists and Hindu. What brings us together as a church family is our faith in the incredible ability of humanity to do what once was thought to be impossible. In this case, reverse aging and make death optional. We are the only brick and mortar transhumanist church in the world, and our services focus on all ways and any ways to extend healthy, healthy human living indefinitely. So people come to me and they say, do you really think you're going to live forever? That's what I want. Once the sun burns out or the Meteor crashes into the earth. There's things that I can't control. But yes, I want to be living for as long as possible, not just 200 years or 500 years. What about 1,000 years? I believe it's possible. I believe right now there are people in this room that will be here in 500 years. In fact, I'm going to have a 500th birthday party, and you're all invited. And I'm gonna, it's going to be interesting to see who showed up and who decided, nah, I'd rather go do something else. I, I, I like to invest my money in, in other stuff and my own life and health. You know? So, yes, you are all invited. I, I, I'm on videotape. We're live streaming this. Hello, everybody who's live streaming in here today. I know there's a number of people who RSVP'd, but were unable to make it tonight. And I know that they're probably live streaming right now. What is our count right back there, Rob, on live stream? Get a report in a minute. Anyway, if you ever wish to watch what's going on, you can join our live stream. Oh, 60 people. That's great. So if you ever want to join our live stream, go to the perpetual.life site. In the upper left corner, live stream, boom, you can do that. If you ever get a cold, don't come here. Just watch it at home. Right? Speaking of colds, anyway, we have a box of, um, of uh, masks on the desk when you come in. And through flu season, we're always going to have a box of surgeon masks. Like you saw me wearing, I'm promoting health and wellness, right? There's a 5% chance I might be contagious. But anyway, I, I pre I, uh, and nobody uses microphone but me. So what I'm saying is um, 
help yourself to a mask as you come into a place. You're, you're welcome to have those. We have special surgeon masks, and you can see Deborah for those. Oh, right. Yes, thank Deborah. So that's what the Church of Perpetual Life, that's a, our, our church in a nutshell. What I'd like to do now, Alex, what I'd like to do now is invite our youth and Check, check. Thank you, Neil. I'm going to invite and introduce real quick. Alex Fidel is our youth um, coordinator, and we'll be taking over from here. So he's going to be doing Q&A and introducing you guys. And here's Alex. Woo! Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. And by the way, the number in the room is 98. Uh, there was a couple people that just walked in. And then I know there's a few people downstairs, I think, still. So we're over 100 people. So All I right. think. I forgot, I forgot to do something. Don't, don't go away. Figure that out. And yeah, I'm going to do something call. right now. Deborah? Say it again. I'm, I'm going to find out here in just a minute. I'm gonna, we, we still have some people coming in. We're going to give the people coming in a chance because I think Bill Andrews will be very proud if he beats Aubrey's record. Aubrey, by the way, is like you got Aubrey, you got Bill Falloon, you got Ray Kurzweil. Right there are the top three. So uh, we're going to see what's, uh, what's the uh, record here tonight in a minute. But if I may have the books. Pardon? I hope so. I know Aubrey hopes so, too. So before I bring you up, Alex, I've got some people to, know, uh, to, uh, to speak to here. As I mentioned, I am a chaplain emeritus with Unity of Venice. And uh, I used to attend a Unity of uh, Hollywood from time to time, and Deborah is a, like you have the credentials of a minister as well. And she is also a past director on the board of trustees or directors. Yes, still on the board of, okay, of Unity of Hollywood. And I, I make mention of that simply because we have four other Unity of Hollywood people right here that I'd like to invite on the stage, please. We let them come here a few times to figure out what they're going to do as they were having some issues and troubles. Ultimately, they decided, much to our disappointment, uh, but the right decision for, for the, for the uh, unity movement, that they were going to shut down Unity of Hollywood. So they sold the building, they sold the building, and they wanted to recognize us in some way. And I'd like to introduce Carolyn and Catherine, Joel, everybody knows Deborah. And Tony. And what I'm going to do, they, 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 they came not just to be recognized, but also to give us some money. After they sold the building, they thought they would give us a, uh, a donation. And we really, really thank you for that. But I'm not going to accept the check. Reverend Musette would have to. Do you not agree? We really have to have Reverend Musette. So Reverend Musette was supposed to be here. She got the flu. Maybe she's watching. I don't know. Great. So Reverend Musette. I appreciate the donation. It's a wonderful thing. And we're going to have you back on May 6th, Sunday, for a, uh, to join the group uh, to be able to make this official presentation. I speak that a little to Reverend Luzette. But I want to recognize you, and I want to give you a copy of Bill Falloon's book, Farmocracy, Farmocracy 2. new book, Farmocracy 2, and Bill is right here, and uh, uh, you know, at some point, if, if you want him to sign the book, we, I'm sure we've got a pen here somewhere. Would you, Bill? Thank you. Afterwards, he'll be very happy to sign for you. Okay. So thank you all for being here and being a part of the service, and I think um, I look forward to getting to know you better, and uh, you're welcome to stay for whatever part of this uh, event that you'd like to stay for. We have, uh, after me, a very short period, of a very short thing that I'd love for you to see. And then um, after that, or whatever, if you've got to go, I understand. Thank you very much. Alex? Alex Fidel, here you go. 
All right, make some noise for Neil. Neil Vandery, our amazing officiator here at the church. As he mentioned, um, you know, his title is officiator. We do things a little bit differently here. Um, I guess I haven't been doing as great of a job uh, as I'd like to uh, with my role, although I have uh, various roles here, because um, I don't see um, as many uh, younger folks as I'd like to see. Actually, actually I do see uh, a little bit more uh, than, than typically, so I'm really excited uh, at the crowd and all the new people that we have tonight. Um, I have the honor of reading, uh, you know, like I mentioned, uh, we are a church, uh, and we have our own uh, gospel. And, uh, you know, a lot of these words kind of have different meanings to people, uh, creator even, uh, that uh, we have at our church. Uh, people have different uh, interpretations of. Um, but, you know, I think it's so great that uh, now with the uh, different churches that are getting more involved and participating, that we're collaborating more with the community, you know, that's so important. I, one of the things that I've always thought when I discovered this uh, organization, this church, a few years back is that um, it seems like there's like this uh, place in between where we are, uh, where it's almost like um, we don't necessarily fit in with the Christians because a lot of them think that, you know, it's a, it's uh, it goes against their uh, beliefs and that sort of thing. And, um, you know, the atheists don't even necessarily want us either. Bob uh, has tried to get the local atheist group out, um, and a, a few of them have, have come around. And, and uh, you know, it's kind of uh, this awkward in-between place that we happen to be in where um, you don't have to suspend uh, your previous beliefs necessarily, really, to embrace uh, this philosophy and, and these teachings, right? Um, no, really, that's a really big deal. Uh, we have our, our prophet uh, at, at our church, right? At a, every church needs a prophet. Is uh, this old school Russian philosopher who was a Christian, um, who kind of, I guess, in his day went against the grain. He was kind of a edgy uh, for, for, for Christians back then because, uh, you know, he, his beliefs were considered radical. He was, uh, well, I'm actually going to read because our uh, sort of gospel, uh, the good news, which is what that translates to. So um, this is good. This is our good news. This is our gospel based off the teachings of Nikolai Fedorov, Nikolai Fedorovich Fedorov. Uh, and so uh, based on his teachings, we basically uh, put the founding uh, beliefs uh, uh, and tenets of this church together. Uh, and uh, so our mission is to assist all people in the radical extension of healthy human life and to provide fellowship for longevity enthusiasts through regular holiday and memorial services. The purposes of the Church of Perpetual Life are to teach scientific rationality along with the Creator's plan that humanity evolve to achieve markedly extended healthy lifespan. To also accelerate the Creator's plan of the common task of humanity, which is to cultivate technology that will facilitate the transformation of life into an environment of perpetual duration. If you've been here before, you've heard these things, but I think it's very important that you know, we continue to uh, keep these things in mind, and obviously for the new people. Uh, also, to enable information sharing amongst our fellow longevity enthusiasts that will facilitate the common task. Uh, to create a sense of belonging, a common bond amongst like-minded individuals, and communal volunteer support for fellow church members who fall ill, who are hospitalized, or otherwise face imminent medical problems to also uh, institutionalize the concept of indefinitely extended lifespans so that others are enlightened and contribute to the common task, as well as to provide a tangible foundation and physical structure to demonstrate the commitment of the Church of Perpetual Life to provide perpetual support to deanimated members, which is uh, members in cryonic suspension, uh, and also advance the field of biomedical research. And lastly, to provide group support, peer support, and rational persuasion for church members and guests to contribute their energies and themselves to the common task of humanity. So to this end, as Neil mentioned, uh, our services are typically once a month, uh, usually the fourth Thursday of the month, although it varies, so uh, stay tuned to our website, perpetual.life, get on the email list. I think there's a physical sign-up sheet around here somewhere. If not, you can go to perpetual.life. That's www.perpetual.life, um, which links to churchofperpetuallife.org. It's just easier to say the other one. Um, and you can put your email address on there, too, to make sure you're getting notified because, uh, as we mentioned, it fluctuates. 
uh, and the events. The doors open at 6 o'clock. As you see, we do the you know uh, snacks and stuff, hors d'oeuvres in the beginning. Um, and then afterwards, uh, we actually have a catered uh, five-star meal uh, from our chef downstairs, um, which we look forward to uh, you know, continuing the conversation of each event uh, with you know, kind of breaking bread is a, a big part of it, you know, as with this fellowship that is so important. And, um, you know, one of the things I'm going to talk about a little bit later um, after our featured speaker and um, our first speaker this evening, which I'm uh, very excited to hear from both of them because they're always enlightening, uh, I got to meet Dr. Bill Andrews in San Diego at the RadFest last year. Uh, if you were there, you probably did too. If not, you should be there next year. Uh, it's coming, or this year, right? It's coming up very soon, yes. Yeah. So. Anybody have the date uh, by chance? So we have a little bit more time than we thought, but uh, September 21st, and you can go to radfest.com to find out more information about that. Um, and um, other than that, we do have a uh, lending library in the back. We always like to point out that, you know, um, as our events are only monthly, uh, of course, there's ways to stay connected with each other on social media, please do check out our Facebook page. Uh, we're on Twitter, YouTube, all of that. All of our past events are uh, archived on our YouTube channel. You can watch every single monthly uh, service that we've hosted here uh, since the last few years on our YouTube channel. Uh, but of course, you're welcome to also check out a book and take with you, um, you know, bring it back next month, you know, two months if you're still reading it, you know, however long uh, you need really. and. Um, we have some donation boxes scattered throughout the uh, church as well, so if you uh, feel so inclined to uh, be so generous to support us, we definitely uh, rely on that as we are a nonprofit uh, church. Um, and uh, the lastly, before I introduce our first speaker, I wanted to, um, this uh, documentary uh, is actually called uh, on Netflix, The Immortalists. If you haven't seen it, uh, it features our featured speaker this evening, uh, Dr. Bill Andrews. Uh, again, it's on Netflix. It's called The Immortalists. It's basically all about um, Dr. Bill Andrews' work as well as Dr. Aubrey de Grey's work. Really fascinating and entertaining movie, uh, to be honest. So uh, we refer to ourselves here as immortalists at the Church of Perpetual Life. Uh, not because we have defeated death, but because we believe that future technology will conquer disease and aging as well as death itself. While we fully understand that this technology does not appear to be currently available, the impressive history of human problem solving and technological advancement gives us faith, like Neil was talking about, in its inevitability. So that is to say that this is going to happen, right? We're going to reach a point in society, in human civilization, right? Whether, you know, hopefully as many of us who are, are in, that are in this room We'll be able to be there physically to see that day, but whether it happens, you know, in uh, you know, 10, 20, 100 years, uh, it, it depends. It depends on whether more churches like this sprout up a across the country. Uh, it depends on uh, whether uh, people like uh, Dr. Andrews are able to continue uh, getting the funding for their research and all of the different uh, you know angles that are being worked on to achieve these goals. Uh, it's not just going to happen. Uh, I mean, it will happen, uh, you know, regardless, uh, in a sense, but how fast it happens depends on how much action is being taken by how many people. Uh, and so that's a really important thing to keep in mind when, you know, we can get caught up in, the, you know, how exciting it is that these things are going to come to pass. But, you know, we can also all really do uh, a small part, which does add up collectively when, we can all, you know, I mean, these days with social media, everybody's a political activist, right? Everybody's always spreading their opinions on, on whatever. Uh, this is the most important conversation that needs to be taking place in, on dinner tables across the world, uh, is these ideas. And so, you know, post about it on Facebook. You know, bring your friends next month. You know, bring your, I, I, I've had, uh, I'm working on getting my uh, actual family members out here, but I've been able to bring some friends several over the years who have come back and, you know, become plugged in. And so, you know, we are basically at that point where we have kind of outgrown this facility. And so, I mean, what's the next step is having more regular uh, frequent events, uh, getting a bigger facility, you know. 
uh, helping people start their own regular meetups and that sort of thing. So there's a lot uh, to do. And uh, with that in mind, I'd like to introduce our uh, founder of the Church of Perpetual Life, Mr. Bill Falloon. Let us put your hands together for Bill Falloon, please. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Alex, for the kind words. I'm going to provide some news updates, uh, some really incredible news updates just six days ago for the first time that I can ever recall. A published study comes out that refers to delaying the rate of biological aging in humans. And what's so remarkable about this study is that it looked at a group starting between 1988 and 1994, and they looked at their rate of aging. And then they studied a group between the year 2007, 2010. And there was a remarkable slowdown in biological aging in people. Now, this is unprecedented as far as anything I've ever read. This is a peer-reviewed published study. It was done on a large population group. And they were, we were able to ascertain that what a lot of you in this room are doing right now to stay healthy, slow aging, it's really working. And what they were able to see, mainly in men, by the way, who are starting to take better care of themselves, their rate of aging is slowing. And some of the parameters they used are standard. You get these on your standard blood tests for the most part, uh, cholesterol, glucose, a C-reactive protein, very important to have blood tested for that, but blood pressure, uh, your breath capacity, a lot of factors that decline with aging, they're not declining as fast because more and more people are taking care of themselves. They realize they don't have to age as quickly. So the title of the study is 60 Becoming the New 50. Uh, well, uh, this is really interesting to think that we may be able to slow our rate of aging significantly. And most of you in this room are doing it now. And this is a quote from one of the researchers who did this published study. The very first evidence, first evidence that aging is being delayed amongst a sample of Americans, a very large sample. When this church started in 2013, the prospect of age delay was not even really conceived of. People just thought aging is something that happened, and all you could do is reduce your risk of disease. Well, now they're talking about slowing the rate of aging, something that me and a number of others have talked about for the last 40 plus years. It's really incredible. And our prophet Nikolai Fedorov, he got some nice publicity last month in National Geographic. They did a story about his prophecies and how they're starting to come true. And, and possibly the most significant one was famine. In his age, many people, entire cities would die of starvation. And he predicted if enough effort were put in, to eradicating the causes of famine, that there be an abundance of food. That's the way it is today. We have more food right now than what we need. And a lot of farms right now aren't even planting because there's such a surplus. The yield per acre, some of the ways that they use to fertilize, they're producing more food than what we need. What's going to happen is we're going to start producing many more added life years based on what we're seeing right now. Incredible. Ray Kurzweil, another prophet. He is someone who has made some rather bold predictions, but his credibility has resulted in lots of people saying, I think he may be right, and I'm going to give you some reasons why his theories are going to soon come to pass. And a lot of this has to do with a part of our brain called the neocortex. This is the part of the brain that enables us to be human. And to put this into perspective, as we evolve, uh, there is only so much room in our skull to contain the neocortex. If we had bigger skulls, we'd all be smarter people. I'm going to tell you a way that Ray Kurzweil feels we're going to become really smart, really fast, if we can live long enough. Now, just so you understand, the early humans, their skulls were not big enough to accommodate that neocortex in the area that has to develop if we are to become human. If we are to become super intelligent, we need more neocortex. And this is, unfortunately, the dilemma that every other species faces. They don't have enough room in their skull to grow their brains big enough to achieve the type of intellect that we enjoy. So we're getting kind of impatient. We want it to get better, just like our iPhones, our computer. We want them to be faster, more memory. We want more storage. We want all that. And yet our skull is limited. So 
we want to enable our brains to accommodate more intellect, more intelligence. And this really puts it in perspective. You look at these different animals, and their brains just aren't big enough to accommodate the intellect that we would like to have uh, ourselves improve. And yet our skulls also are limited. There's only so far that we can go. So we want more neocortex. Problem is, there's no more room to accommodate it. There's no more room to accommodate that. So what do we do? Well, Ray Kurzweil has an interesting strategy about this. And for those who don't know Ray Kurzweil, he is acclaimed as one of the most intelligent people who's ever lived. He's got numerous inventions. He's accomplished feats that very few people do on a singular basis, and he's done it in multiple, multiple ways. He's been the recipient of numerous awards, honorary doctorate degrees. He's currently working on all kinds of technologies, some of them commercial, some of them related to the life sciences. Ray Kurzweil is an immortalist. He doesn't want to die. He's looking to stay around forever just like I am. So we have a lot of respect for Ray. He's written books that have helped enable people to understand that people are going to start living longer. The human race is on the verge of exponential increases in healthy longevity. And it goes beyond that. It goes beyond just healthy longevity. It's intelligent longevity. Ray currently is the chief uh, engineer at a division of Google right now where he is working on artificial intelligence, which ultimately is going to be how we achieve immortality. The machines will do the thinking that exceed our current abilities. So here's the situation. What is our exit strategy? We're growing older. If we don't do something about aging, unfortunately, that will take us out before the incredible future arrives. So what do we do about that? Well, we have to extricate ourselves from the current state that we're in. We're human, we're biological, and while we can do a lot to reverse the biological processes, we're going to need to do somewhat more to achieve the kind of longevity that at least I want to personally attain. So this is Ray Kurzweil's initial exit strategy step. Stay alive until approximately year 2029. Now for some of us in here, easy. We're younger, and we probably will make that happen. But I'm not that young. I'm 63 years of age. I don't have any guarantee whatsoever I'm going to be alive in year 2029. Therefore, I experiment on myself with a lot of different interventions that hopefully will slow aging, reverse it, protect me against diseases. I'm very aggressive about intervening into the aging process in myself. And I was so gratified to learn that just six days ago, it's working in people who are doing a lot less than me and a lot less than a lot of other people in this room. But by 2029, Ray Kurzweil predicts gene editing will be perfected. He talked about that in his church uh, with a, about a scientist at Harvard named Dr. George Church. He is working on gene editing technology using CRISPR-Cas9 technology. He feels within the next five to 10 years, he will make people biologically immortal. Spectacular projection. He has raised over $100 million. People don't put that kind of money into a project unless they think there's some scientific validity to it. So gene editing should enable us by 2029 to live really healthy and not contend with the kind of diseases we have to now. And then the final exit, that Ray predicts, this is a transhumanism type of a philosophy. At that point, our neocortex, that limited space in our brain where our neocortex can't grow anymore, is going to integrate with the cloud. We will become immortal at that stage. The people who say, I don't really want that, well, maybe you don't want your smartphone. Maybe you don't like to use your computer. But I suspect you all do. I think probably everyone in this room is using technology. And once we can interface our neocortex with the cloud, and have instant access to every bit of information that's ever been published, have instant access to every new technology that evolves in real time, and not have to read about it the next day in the newspaper, we are going to be immortal. Before that happens, we need to deal with our biological limitations. And that's what Dr. Bill Andrews has been working on for well over 20 years. I met Bill Andrews about 20 years ago. He's seeking to find ways to keep our telomeres from shortening in fact, he'd like to see them lengthen 
so that we can perhaps enjoy many decades of healthy biological longevity. And I have a tremendous amount of respect for Dr. Andrews' scientific acumen and his tireless dedication. I mean, he's been doing this for a long time. Most people will start something for a while and just say, it's not working, I'm going to walk away from it. He's been persistent. So we have a lot of respect for that. And again, exponentially enhanced intelligence. This is going to happen. It is inevitable. Billions of dollars are being put into it right now. Ray Kurzweil is working on it, along with a number of others. We're all going to get to be really smart people at some point very soon. But we won't be there unless we stay biologically healthy. So again, Ray Kurzweil's final exit plan is to get out of these biological bodies if we want to, or stay in them and probably just merge right with the cloud, and we will become immortal at that point. Our, our personality, our memories, our ability to function will be controlled with the same type of uh, situations that we have with the electronic community today. We're going to have that technology. And to give you an idea about the fact that when you talk about something, it seems like maybe it's too far away in the future. This timeline, going back about 30 years, 1987, we fought the FDA, along with some others, to get a drug called tissue plasminogen activator approved. This drug dissolves blood clots that are occluding flow to the coronary arteries, to a cerebral artery, and after a tremendous amount of pressure was put on the FDA, they finally approved it to treat acute coronary thrombosis, a blood clot that occludes a coronary artery. Uh, but we thought, well, if it's able to dissolve a clot in a coronary artery, what about the cerebral artery? What about reversing stroke? Nine years later, FDA approves it to reverse stroke. But you look at that timeline, it's taken a heck of a long while before the technology is integrating into routine medical practice. Now, if you knew about TPA in 1996, and you had a stroke, and your family member was in the ER room slowly becoming paralyzed, you might be able to ask your doctor, or the ER doctor, would you try the TPA? He might say yes in response to you asking. Without asking, he might not implement it. But this is a long timeline, but it just shows you how long it takes from a concept that's actually approved by the government before it enters routine medical practice. When you come to this church, we try to update you on technologies that you can use right now to potentially save your life. And right now, there are millions of people paralyzed in nursing home facilities. They're living horrible lives, and most of that is needless. I say that from the standpoint of 2015, the mechanical clot retrieval procedure was validated. It's called an endovascular thrombectomy. It was on that chart I showed you before, that timeline. You can see 2015 thrombectomy effective up to six hours. Uh, two years later, it's shown to be effective up to 24 hours, and the American Heart Association has now issued new guidelines showing that thrombectomy is effective up to 24 hours. These are brand new recommendations the American Heart Association made in January this year, and if you have a symptom of a stroke, you want to go to the nearest thrombectomy-capable hospital because those are the people who may be able to reverse that stroke so you can leave that hospital on your own instead of be tra being transported to a nursing facility. So this is information that we're describing now so you don't have to suffer an age-related calamity. And again, we need to make it the year 2029 so that we can take advantage of what will be age reversal technologies. So I'm going to introduce Bill Andrews, uh, unless uh, Neil is going to do that. Uh, we're going to see if uh, you could, would mind doing a few uh, questions, Q&A, if anybody has any questions from the crowd. Sh sure, sure. Yeah. Okay, if anybody has any questions, feel free to raise your hand. I'll walk over to you, and you can ask it on the microphone. All right, go. This, this is just a comment, and um, I'm a critical care nurse, and in our national conferences, uh, they say it takes 15 years for the evidence of something to get into practice. That's too long. Too that long. 15 years too long. Thank you for stating that, and that's absolutely correct, and often it's longer than 15 years. 
I'm, I'm going to say something, and the person who I'm going to talk about may be listening, but I, I always want to just be forthright. I had the privilege Sunday of having dinner with a MDJD, neurosurgical resident, a brilliant 32-year-old individual who I think is going to help us a lot with both aging, bionics. He is very, very motivated to do everything he can to help facilitate the purposes of this church and the immortality community. But he's working in a major New York hospital, and they still are laboring under the guidelines issued in 2015 that endovascular thrombectomy is only effective for six hours. That's what they were laboring under, and I pulled out my laptop, and I showed them some of the studies, and I said, you know, that changed within a year and a half. May 2017, the data came out showing that thrombectomy effective up to 24 hours. You can imagine how many people are needlessly suffering from a stroke. Just again, putting that timeline up there, the thrombectomy actually could have been used around 2000. It was shown effective in 2000 and had not been perfected. That 15-year gap is almost perfect. We're right now American Heart Association saying up to 24 hours, and yet the message has not gotten around to the community yet, to all the medical community, which is why you have to take charge of your knowledge base. And if you know there's a technology that can reverse a thrombotic stroke, well, you got to tell the person treating you, the, your loved one or yourself, use it. Don't hold back. I'll pay for it. I'll save a sign a waiver of liability if that's a concern. But use that technology to save my life or the life of a loved one that's sitting right there. Uh, though with thrombectomy technology, there's not enough interventionalists at every hospital. You've got to know which hospital to go to. And I encourage everyone to find that out. So if stroke symptoms develop, you'll know where to go. Thank you for that piece of information, Bobby. 15 years is a good average. How long? New technology will evolve into clinical practice way too long. Thank you, Bill. We have another question here in the back. I read about that just recently in the last week about you know, thrombectomy and people in particular. I wonder if you could have any thoughts on that. Is that a political compromise that we have to agree on? I'm not quite sure. Who? Okay, Broward General, she mentioned. Okay, if he, let, let me tell you what I know about it. There is a shortage of vascular interventionalists who know how to do this. Um, so you, you really need to know ahead of time which hospital is thrombectomy capable. Now, probably in the next four or five years, they'll all be. But this is an emerging technology. It's not their fault that there's not enough trained people. It's, it's that new of a technology. So what was told to me here by a, a nurse is a, a trauma center, Broward General, North Broward General, I believe Memorial Hospital here in Hollywood. Okay, that, that, that's what, what was told to us, good information, but the, what I've been recommending is the word thrombectomy capable hospital is what you want to look for because they'll guarantee 24-hour coverage. Because if you have it, in, like, let's say, 1 in the morning and those people aren't on call to come in, you may be a victim of paralysis that could have been reversed. So um, our, our, what we've been recommending uh, for the last three years, by the way, at this church is identify the hospital that's able to implement this technology now. All right, thank you very much, Bill. Uh, how about a round of applause for Bill Falloon? <laughs> Unless you wanted to introduce Bill, I had a few words I was going to say about him. All right, yes, thank you, Bill. That should work there. Okay, thanks again, Bill Falloon, again, the founder of our church. Um, a man who hardly needs an introduction. You know him, I'm sure, through his many other uh, projects and organizations that he's uh, been involved in helping start and contribute to. So uh, thanks again, Bill.
always uh, insightful. Um, the next man, our, our uh, featured speaker this evening, um, which uh, I mentioned earlier, The Immortalists is the documentary on Netflix that you can watch all about them and, you know, watch with your family. It's, a, again, a really entertaining uh, watch. Um, but uh, he has been working on these uh, goals uh, cure, of curing aging uh, for many, many years uh, through his organization, Sierra Sciences. Um, our speaker tonight was born to television producer Ralph Andrews as a child was told by his father that he should grow up to become a doctor and find a cure for aging. How about that? Okay. Dr. Andrews graduated from Kate School in 1971, from University of California, San Diego in 1976, and earned his PhD in molecular and population genetics at the University of Georgia in 1981. He's a molecular biologist and gerontologist whose career has centered on searching for a cure for human aging, Andrews is the founder and president of the biotech company Sierra Sciences. In 1997, he led the team at Geron Corporation that was the first to successfully identify human telomeres. Andrews is an accomplished ultramarathon runner, which I spoke with him earlier, uh, and he was at the beach uh, a couple of miles, um, so I can attest to that. Um, and again, if you've seen the movie, uh, frequently running races as long as 138 miles long. In 2008 and 2000, do that at my age. <laughs> so, in 2008, 2009, Andrews was successfully completed the Badwater Ultra Marathon, a 135-mile race through Death Valley in temperatures uh, adequately uh, titled, right? Uh, temperatures exceeding 128 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, Dr. Andrews is also, as I mentioned, the subject of the 2014 documentary, The Immortalist. Please give a warm Hollywood welcome to our speaker tonight, the man that discovered telomerase, Dr. Bill Andrews. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's an honor to be here. I want to thank Neil for inviting me. I've been a very big fan for a long time of the Church of Perpetual Life. It's the first time I've been on this coast to actually actually be here. I'm also very honored to be following Bill Falloon. I mean, this guy's incredible. I, I think he underestimated. He didn't talk about himself enough here. But he's, he runs what I think is the number one organization in the United States Find things that will help you stay healthy longer. And it's because he wants to stay healthy longer. So he's running this company. Everything they sell works. And I don't know if he realizes it, but I pay him a lot of money every month to buy products that I get directly from the Life Extension Foundation. But he, he, he's also a leader in the field. I mean, he's made the field of anti-aging respectable when it, when it hasn't always been. So thank you, Bill. And it's an honor. <laughs> I hear a lot of breathing on okay. Um, so let me start off with who I am. Lisa? Can you still hear me? Okay. So I'm a medical researcher. I've been a medical researcher essentially my whole life, but mostly since 1980. And one of the first things that I was involved in, I've been involved in a lot of the big blockbusters was human growth hormone in collaboration with Enentech. This was a drug that was used to make dwarfs small, uh, taller. But um, of course, as you know, this became uh, one of those illegal drug enhancing, sports enhancing drugs that uh, a lot of athletes have used. Now, the next one I'm real surprised to hear that Bill Floon has a role in this is TPA. I'm actually one of the inventors of TPA. Again, in association with uh, Enentech. This was, again, every ambulance in the world right now carries this. Because if you have a heart attack, that's the first thing you want into you to break up the blood clot that's, that's causing you not to get circulation. Um, I'm also, this is speaking of uh, illegal sports enhancing drugs, I'm also one of the inventors of EPO, which is erythropoietin, which is what Lance Armstrong used to cheat with. But when we made this, we were making it for, uh, so that uh, people with anemia would have more red blood cells. Well, versus uh, people who knew a lot about sports and why people are limited in sports knew that this would improve your ability to be able to be an athlete. Um, <clears throat> also, now these are all with another company called uh, Throm uh, Burlex Biosciences, one of the inventors of thrombomodulin, which actually prevents blood clots. Uh, osteoinductive factor, probably the first anti-aging drug I ever worked with, is for uh, curing osteoporosis. It's actually still in clinical studies. 
Uh, beta seron, the very first drug ever for multiple sclerosis. I played a, a key role in the development of that too. And then the most, my most latest and the one I've been stuck on ever since is the enzyme telomerase. Now, I've been in the biotech field for 37 years. I went straight from getting my PhD at University of Georgia right into biotech because I, I looked at biotech as the, really the fastest way to get things available to people. Um, I've also been doing gene therapy, which I'll talk about a little later in the talk, for 35 years. G people think of gene therapy as a brand new technology, but it's been around for a long, long time. It's just been in the, historically, it's been unsafe because of the methods that it's used to deliver the gene can actually cause harm to the organism. But it was still great for research. Now, on the stuff I'm going to be talking about today, I'm on over 50 US issued patents. But there's been a lot of companies that I've worked with that have filed patents uh, on the things that I had invented for this role. Uh, but my background hasn't been just in what I'm talking about today. Uh, after I got out of my graduate school and went into biotech, my focus was mostly cancer research, heart disease research, and inflammation research, and a little bit of aging up until about uh, 20 years ago when I got fully into aging. I was uh, picked as United States Inventor of the Year, actually second place. Uh, the people who discovered the HIV protease inhibitor got first place, and it was on a coin, co coin toss. We, were, we, had, we had a tie, and uh, we got second on a coin toss. But U.S. Inventor of the Year Award for my cancer research. People think of me as just an aging scientist, but I've actually got a very, very strong cancer background. As, as Alex was pointing out, oh, and thank you, Alex. That was a great introduction, one of the best I've heard anybody give of me. Uh, the immortalist, uh, people don't know, is it almost won an Oscar for Best New Documentary in 2014. It got picked as the, uh, one of the top 10 out of thousands that were make, thousands are made every year, but it didn't make the top five, and only the top five get nominated. But I was pretty proud of that. It's actually a very good documentary, and Alex was saying you want to have your families watch it. Anybody who's seen it, you probably want to cover your children's eyes at a certain place when you get to see more of Aubrey de Grey than you think you're going to. <laughs> uh, I'm also an author of two books, Curing Aging and Telomere Lengthening. Uh, those are right here. I wish I had copies to give out or sell, but I'm, I've only got some. If people would like to see them, you can buy them on Amazon.com. And then lastly, I want to say that it's not just telomeres that's important. It's that if you want to live as long as possible and live healthy as long as possible, you've got to do a lot of things. And I believe inflammation is actually one of the major causes of aging in humans. So I, I kind of lead a lifestyle and diet that I call zero inflammation. Of course, there's no such thing as zero inflammation, and you don't want zero inflammation. But it, it's a, a kind of a lifestyle that I'll talk about a little bit more uh, because I believe that it's going to help anybody who's focusing on decreasing inflammation as much as possible will live as long as longer than anybody else. So I, I founded a company called Sierra Sciences in Reno, Nevada. Uh, as Alex was mentioning, I led the research that discovered human telomerase. Uh, at Geron Corporation, but when we discovered it, we also found out that the anti-sense of telomerase will kill cancer cells, and, and they do so by um, uh, causing the cells to die, essentially of accelerated aging. Uh, so Geron Corporation, the investors who are more interested in the return on investment than the actual what these things can do for humanity, said, stop all working on aging, focus on cancer. So. You know, I, I'm very interested in cancer, as I, you know, as I told you, I have a strong background. But I decided nobody's working on aging, or not enough people are working on aging. At that time, I had never even heard of Aubrey de Grey and some of the other people out there are now on the scene. But I left and started Sierra Sciences with the number one goal, figure out how to not only stop the aging process and stop declining health, but reverse it all. That was in the late 1990s when I discovered this, or founded this company. This is pictures of some of the labs we have. We have 10,000 square feet of lab space. It's a very productive uh, research facility. I'll show more pictures later. But I want to start off with, there's a lot of theories on aging. And, that's, and I don't want you to read all these things. I just want you to see that there's a lot there. There's a lot of people working on a lot of different things. And we can't all work on the same thing. It wouldn't be productive if 
we need everybody working on a lot of things. So I don't want anybody to think today that I believe that the theory I'm working on is the only thing that needs to be done. I believe that it's <clears throat> there's a lot of theories, and a lot of the top scientists, we actually don't find ourselves competing with one another. We find ourselves helping each other. The goal of science is not to create theories. The goal of science is to prove or disprove them. And a lot of people don't know this, but when Aubrey de Grey first came on the scene about, let's say, 10, 15 years ago, my investors at the time were very stunned by that because they thought, well, here are sciences who are way better than Aubrey de Grey. And so they arranged to have a, a debate scheduled. They invited Aubrey de Grey. They got Channel 4 News to film it. And I, you know, I, I wasn't into debating and stuff like that, but I said, okay, sure, I'll do it. Uh, you have to do what your investors say, and especially when they're major owner, owners of the company. Uh, and uh, so I got up first during the debate. We had an audience and cameras and everything. And I talked a little bit about telomere biology, and I talked about theory. I didn't say, we know this, we know that. I said, we got theories, and we got to test them, and here's how we're going to test them. Then Aubrey got up, and he talked a lot. He talked about all the stuff he's going to do. He never said, we know this for certain. He said, we have to test this. We have to test this. We'll find out. Then it was my turn to get up again, because I'm supposed to do the rebuttal. And I, I sat there, and I said, I agree with everything Aubrey just said. And before I could finish saying that, Aubrey said, I agree with everything Bill just said. And, and so we got up and we talked a little bit about, about how, we, you know, we don't have the answers. We've got to get the answers. Nobody really knows what causes aging yet. We have to test these things. We have to find these things. Aubrey and I have been great friends ever since. I mean, he doesn't, if he, if he had to bet that what I'm doing isn't going to work, he would probably say, yeah, what he's doing is more, more likely to work than what I'm doing, and vice versa. But that doesn't mean we're not helping each other. He's actually helped me find funding. He, I've helped him find funding. Uh, I've even paid, you know, uh, sponsored some of his conferences, things like that. We are supporting each other. People often think we are enemies. Right? But we actually, if you watch The Immortalist, you'll see that we are actually very good friends. Um, but the goal is to, science is to prove or disprove them. And to do that, we need to test them. And the obstacle is not the science. The obstacle is the funding. And I'll come back a little bit more about that a little bit later. But both Aubrey de Grey and I, our biggest obstacle is getting the funding to do the research. I will say we know exactly what to do to test our theories. We just can't get it done fast enough because of the lack of funding. Let me talk about my theory. It's related to aging, telomeres, and telomerase, which I'll, you'll learn about if you don't already know. Let me, let me make a comment. Every time you see a red square border like this, this is an important slide. For those of you who just want, want to hear about what you should be doing to make yourself younger, healthier, longer, and stuff like that, you don't really care about the science, fall asleep, go ahead. When you see a red box, that's when I think you should wake up, except for this particular slide. I just show this for example's sake. Okay, so to explain what telomeres are, because there's probably always somebody in the audience that really is learning this for the first time, we need to zoom in on a human being. First thing we see is that a human is made up of about 100 trillion cells. We are, that's what we are. We're 100 trillion cells. And most of the theories on why we age are actually saying that we age because these cells age. We've got to stop these cells from aging. Zoom in further, we see that every cell contains a nucleus. And inside these nuclei are found chromosomes, shown here in blue. Each, each, well, let me zoom in on one chromosome now. And you see that the chromosome is made up of two arms, the top arm and the bottom arm. Inside each of those arms is a very, very long DNA molecule, like a string of beads. Think of it like a long shoelace, and, and, and it's uh, got genes organized along this string of beads. It's really long, so it's all coiled up like a slinky inside of each arm. 
Now, what we are talking about is the very tips of these chromosomes. And think of the caps on your shoelaces. These are called the telomeres. That's where the telomere is. So think of the caps on your shoelaces. They're equivalent to the telomeres on your chromosome. And what I want to do is I want to show you that telomeres are about 15,000 bases in length. Bases are units of measurement for chromosomes. And the chromosomes are actually about 100 million bases in length. The telomere is only about 15,000 bases in length. At least when we're first conceived. And here's where all the problems begin. As soon as we, our cells start to divide, we're a single cell embryo, become two, and then four, and then eight. As soon as those cells start to divide, our telomeres get shorter and shorter and shorter. I have known unit of measurement at every single cell division. And so <clears throat> by the time we've gone from a single cell embryo to a newborn baby, there's been a lot of cell division. And so the telomeres get shorter and shorter and shorter. And when we're, when we're uh, newborn babies, they've already gone, gotten down to 10,000 bases in length. And then they shorten down to 100,000 or uh, 5,000 bases in length, and our cells lose the ability to, to uh, function anymore. Let me, let me just review that really fast. We're conceived at 5,000 bases, or uh, sorry, we're conceived at 15,000 bases, we're born at 10,000 bases, and we die of old age at just over 5,000 bases. 15, 10, 5. <clears throat> Those numbers are the length of our telomeres. And it's, this is not a theory anymore. This is every single lab that's ever worked on growing human cells in petri dishes know that the cells can only divide a certain number of times. And when the telomeres get down to 5,000 bases, those cells lose the ability to function. I'm not saying this is the only cause of aging, but it's definitely one cause. I mean, there is no way our telomeres can, can our cells can function when telomeres get down to 5,000 bases in length. So of all the things that we got to do, this is definitely one of them if we ever want to cure the aging process. It's actually a kind of a clock, too. When I first learned about telomeres, before the discovery of the enzyme telomerase, people were saying that you could actually measure the length of telomeres and tell somebody how old they are. More importantly, you could tell them how long it'll be before they die of old age. I've been looking for a clock ever since my father suggested I get into this field when I was 10 years old. And I suddenly thought, this is the first clock I've ever seen, the first potential clock. So I, I went up to the speaker right after, before he even got off the podium, I said, has anybody figured out how to stop the shortening and lengthening? And he said, nope, we've been working on it for years. Nobody's figured it out. And I, he, he knew my background from all the other big blockbusters. And I said, well, let me come and work for you, and I'll discover it in three months. He said, OK, the shortest job interview I've ever had. And I went to Geron Corporation, and three months and 17 days later, I led the research that discovers new and telomerase, <laughs> which, which I haven't even gotten to yet. But I'll tell you about it. Okay, so let me first say that we've now coined a term called telomeropathy. Telomeropathy is a disease. It's an unhealthy consequence of short telomeres. Well, it turns out there's a lot of these different things. But aging is the most common telomeropathy that we know of. Everybody suffers from aging. But it's not just aging. But, you know, as I said, it's not the only telomeropathy. Uh, this is a list of a lot of different diseases that have been shown to be, some of them shown to be caused by telomere shortening, or some have been just shown to be correlated with telomere shortening. In some of these cases, it might be, the shortening might be an effect of the disease, but there's a high probability that everything that will sit on this list is actually in part, at least, caused by telomere shortening, and these are called telomeropathy. And <clears throat> I had mentioned that there were a lot of different theories I mentioned that there were a lot of different theories on what causes aging and stuff, but I, wanna, I want you to think of each of these theories as a stick of dynamite. We have all these theories burning inside of our cells all at the same time. The question is, which stick of dynamite has the shortest fuel? Because that's the one we need to work with first. And so uh, that's which, which stick has the shortest fuse. And we don't really know, okay? My theory is that telomere shortening is the shortest, uh, sh uh, 
the dynamite with the shortest, the shortest fuse. Mm. Now, Aubrey thinks other fuses are shorter. And he might be right, too. This is why he needs just as much support as I do. So, and this is why Bill Falloon and others like Bill feels by the best. He goes around promoting all the different fields, making this whole field seem re reputable. It helps us all try to get funding to fund our research. Now, to make things a little even more complicated, humans might not necessarily have the same shortest views as mice do. There's a lot of data now suggesting that mice don't age like humans. And so a lot of the mouse data, we hear something is reversed aging in mice, maybe it doesn't work in humans at all. And in fact, that's been shown for a lot of different things so far. So we can't just really depend on mouse data to be able to tell us how we're going to cure aging in humans. We have to actually do clinical studies. Again, Bill Floon is leading a lot of these clinical studies right now on trying to find out what really affects aging in humans. Okay, <clears throat> how can we lengthen telomeres or stop the shortening or lengthen them? Because that's what we got to do. Here he is, and we, we show this in the early days, and I'll come back to that data, that when we lengthen the telomeres, human cells grown in a Petri dish got younger in every way imaginable. So lengthening telomeres could be a key. And I'm going to come back to, it's not proof of concept, but it's a supportive concept. Now, before we can really, before I can get really to how do we lengthen telomeres, we got to, we got to, oh, first of all, Sierra Sciences, my company, has spent over $45 million trying to figure this out so far. Very expensive. And, you know, amazingly, it's been kind of like a weird history, but amazingly, I still own 100% of that company. So I've still gotten, been juggling around investors, buying some of them out, stuff like that. So I'm still in control, but we have spent $45 million so far trying to solve this problem. And I'm expecting to spend another $45, $50 million before we actually get something that, well, maybe not even that much. I'll come back to other stuff that we're doing in a, in a minute. But, but in order to first talk about how to lengthen telomeres, I need to explain that telomere shortening and lengthening is like a tug of war. We have our shorteners, and we have our lengtheners. When these, when they're pulling back, because we get when a cell divides, telomeres get shorter, and then and they get longer, and they get shorter, and then they get longer. It's like a tug of war going back and forth. Now, in almost all of our cells, except our reproductive cells, our reproductive cells, well, all of our cells have just the shorteners. We don't have anything lengthening going on, except for our reproductive cells. And that's important because our reproductive cells have to not have telomere shortening. Otherwise, our children will be born with shorter telomeres than we have. And their children will be born with shorter telomeres than they have. We would have been extinct as a species after about three generations. So our reproductive cells, what are called our primordial germ cells and our embryonic stem cells and things like that, don't have any telomere shortening at all. And that's why we can continue having children you know, is born at as young as we were when we were born. Okay, so most of my research in discovering telomeres, as I mentioned, was done looking at the reproductive cells. Why, what do the reproductive cells have that other cells don't have? Okay, first, how can we slow down the rate of aging? This is, so diet and lifestyle can actually, doesn't actually lengthen telomeres, but it can reduce the rate of telomere shortening. And here's now the red box again around right, on the back screen. It doesn't show the whole red box, but this is stuff now that I think wake up if you have been sleeping. Because this is important stuff. In order to maintain, to decrease the rate of your telomere shortening as much as possible, you want to reduce inflammation and oxidative stress. And I want you to re remember that inflammation is, is something that is like a match in a forest. Something you have to be very responsible. You can't just temporarily stop inflammation and think it's okay and take it to do something that might cause inflammation every once in a while. It's like a match to a forest. A little bit can cause a big problem and take a long time to put out. When you do something that induces your immune system to, call it, to start producing uh, immune functions that attack whatever is in the body, these things stay around for a long period of time. You don't, you want, you've got to come up with some kind of way to reduce inflammation and stick with it. And that's the best way to stay healthy as long as I can because 
inflammation and oxidative stress, one of the targets for those is the length of your telomeres. They will accelerate the length, shortening of your telomeres. And you can, by, not, by staying away from inflammatory agents and uh, free radicals, you can actually decrease that rate. So how do you do that? One is exercise. Now, <clears throat> exercise is kind of complicated because you can actually do exercise in a way that actually increases inflammation a lot and oxidative stress. But my rule of thumb is when it quits being fun, I mean, it's not, I mean, athletes, very competitive athletes, I think this is, no way would they do that. This is my philosophy, okay? If it quits being fun, quit, because then you're only harming yourself, okay? Keep it, and, and surprisingly, if you do this and save it for another day, you find out it, you can be, you can stay fun longer and longer and longer. This is how I got into where I'm running hundreds, hundred mile races all the time, because it stays fun. I mean, if you watch the Immortalist, you're going to find out that I didn't have fun the whole time when I was running this race in the Himalayas at 118,000 feet elevation. But uh, <clears throat> it was sometimes, sometimes it, it's, it's, you, you really want to finish anyway. But it's, it, that, that race probably shortened my lifespan a little bit. But, uh, most of my other races are, 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 if it quits being fun, I quit and then wait for another one. That's, I think, keep the, uh, oxidative stress and inflammation low. Now, I highly recommend something called ALCAD. Is there anybody here from ALCAD here? I heard there was going to be a representative from ALCAD. ALCAD, and there's other companies like that, <coughs> are a way to actually get blood drawn from yourself and find out what foods you eat cause you inflammation. And everybody's different. Okay? There is no one diet. Find out what you what foods cause inflammation in you, and quit eating those foods. I mean, that's what I've done. I've just had my third one done in the last like five years, uh, <clears throat> and it's amazing how much healthier you feel and stuff like that if you stay away from the foods that cause you inflammation. And surprisingly, if you stay away from a long, long time, they quit causing you inflammation. You can continue them again. So I recommend you search for a test called ALCAT and get yourself tested. I also encourage you to measure your C-reactive protein, CRP. This is one of the best markers of inflammation. And I, I try to get my CRP measured after every race. And I'm proud to say that it's always undetected. Okay, they, they say that you know, anything under score of two is okay. I think two is way too high. I think you want to keep your CRP scores undetectable. If, you, if it gets high, then you've overdone it. That's a good sign, good way to measure are you pushing too hard in your exercises and stuff? Antioxidants, take antioxidants, you know, uh, alpha lipoic acid, vitamin E, uh, lots of uh, 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 N acetylcysteine. A lot of these things are really good for you. Just read what's on the bottle, take that dose, because there is such a thing as too much antioxidants. They can actually become pro-oxidants then and actually be harmful. Omega-3 fatty acids. This is now an, an anti-inflammatory. It also has some um, antioxidant activity. Uh, take omega-3 fatty acids. People, it's been shown in scientifically peer-reviewed studies, just like everything else I'm going to show you now. It's been shown in scientifically peer-reviewed studies that if you take lots of omega-3 fatty acids, and you've been doing it for many, many years, your telomeres are going to be longer than your friends that haven't been taking it. Not because it lengthened your telomeres, it just decreased the rate of shortening. Vitamin D, same thing. 10,000 units of vitamin D a day, 5,000 units. And this is something I buy from Bill Falloon every month. I get my vitamin D from there. And, uh, uh, and, and also my omega-3s. And it, it, it's something I strongly believe decreases the rate of my telomere shortening. Don't smoke. Smoking is one of the best things you can do to cause accelerated telomere shortening. Don't be obese. Again, that causes accelerated telomere shortening. Reduce stress. And when I say stress, I don't mean just uh, oxidative stress, but also psychological stress. Learn to meditate. You know, learn and yoga. I mean, I take yoga six times a week. It's a really good way to decrease the rate of your telomere shortening. And there's several scientifically peer-reviewed journal studies showing that. Reduce pessimism. If you don't believe you're going to live to be 100, you won't. And your telomeres will prove it. Okay, so believe you can actually live longer, and you will. 
And then I encourage you to measure your telomere lengths regularly. And there's a lot of companies that do that. And unfortunately, I don't know if anybody here is in, with any of the companies that do that. But most of the companies don't actually work. I, there's a procedure called PCR. I'm an expert in PCR. I was there when PCR was developed. It's not a really good technique for measuring things. So I stay away from techniques using uh, measuring telomeres that use PCR. I highly recommend a company called LifeLink, which doesn't use PCR, and their web website's right there. So if you want to get your telomere links, and just so you know, I'm gonna. Looks like I'm making a few plugs for a few companies. I don't get kickbacks from them. Uh, I'm on their advisory board in some cases. I do it as a volunteer. Uh, so because I'm trying to stay my, keep myself as a scientist, I'm not a promoter of products, but I want everybody to know how to keep yourself healthy. Okay, so I'm going to be saying a few things. But that's because I really believe in these things. But LifeLink is, is, I think, the best place in the world to get your telomere links measured. So, and these are things you can do now. This is why this slide has a red box around it. It's because these are things you can do now, and I encourage everybody to do these things to stay healthy as long as you can. Okay, it says we can go to essentially from four people pulling to accelerate telomere shortening down to two. Why can't we go below this basal rate of level telomere shortening? And so to explain that, I need to use an analogy. It's all the process of DNA replication. Every time your cells divide, you have a single cell and it divides to become two daughter cells, everything inside that parent cell needs to be duplicated. When the cell divides, the new two daughter cells have the exact same ingredients as the uh, parent cell did. And that includes the DNA molecule that I showed you and talked about before and that side, that chromosome. I want you to think of DNA replication as making a new row of bricks on a brick wall. So think of that top row of bricks as a chromosome. Now we're going to make a new row of bricks on top of that when the cell is getting ready to divide. Let's get rid of the other bricks first, and we'll get rid of that cat. And now the cell is getting ready to divide, and a bricklayer comes along laying a row of bricks. Unfortunately, cells don't have IQs, and so they put the bricklayer on top of the wall, and, and anybody knows better than to stand on top of a wall when you're backing up on it. But <clears throat> chromosomes are long, so it's a long, arduous process. So this bricklayer is going along for a long period of time making this new chromosome just before the cell divides. Of course, what we're really interested in is what happens way at the telomere. And so when the bricklayer finally gets there, we're going to see why it was a bad idea to be on top of that wall. It's because he can't step back and have a place to stand when he puts the last brick on top. Now, this is a great analogy, but it's actually very, very identical to exactly what's happening inside of our cells. Brick layer is called DNA polymerase 1, and it does move along the DNA just like this brick layer, and then when it gets to the end, it cannot replicate to the very end. As a result, every new chromosome is shorter than the original chromosome. And there's nothing you can do. You, you can't, there's no diet or lifestyle that's going to make this disappear. It's because of the fact that the lack, cell lacks the ability to do anything at the end, except, as I said before, our reproductive Every time our cells divide, our telomeres get a little bit shorter. Now, <clears throat> this is what I call the basal level switch. So we're going to go through a few more cell divisions here. I'm going to skip through this. Okay. This is called the basal level. But if you want to age faster, there are plenty of things you can do. Okay? And this is anything unrelated to an unhealthy lifestyle. So obesity, lack of exercise, smoking, psychological stress, all these things actually cause the production of free radicals and inflammation that actually accelerate the rate of your telomere shortening. As a result, your telomeres shorten even faster. Of course, as I mentioned, there are things we can do about this already, including meditation and don't smoke and don't be obese and exercise. And that's called accelerated telomere shortening. Okay, <clears throat> well, that is pretty much what we can do now. And I highly recommend following a woman called Dr. Elisa Eppel, E-P-E-L. 
She's written a really good book on the telomere, uh, the telomere effect, it's called. She's co-authored with a Nobel Prize winner, Elizabeth Blackman. But Elisa Eppel is probably the world's leading authority on things you can do, lifestyle things you can do to keep your telomeres as long as possible. Okay, how do we go from this to that? Okay, <clears throat> that is what we want to do to lengthen our telomeres. And that's a whole different subject than trying to reduce the rate of shortening. And that is where the enzyme telomerase comes in. As I I, discover, I led the research. There's no such thing as a medical research where only one person discovers anything. This is why the Nobel Prizes are so complicated. It's always like who originated a certain field. That's how Nobel Prizes in medicine are always awarded. But I led the research at Geron Corporation. I discovered this enzyme. The green thing, the green squiggle thing is the DNA molecule. The factory looking thing is bound to the very tip of that DNA molecule. And what it's doing is it's lengthening the telomere. It binds to the very tip of the chromosome and lengthens it. So that's what it does. Telomere, telomerase lengthens telomeres. A lot of people get those words interchangeably, just telomerase lengthens telomeres. Telomerase is an enzyme, the telomere is the DNA. Okay, going back to the brick lane model, this is, the brick layer is still going to fall off that wall when it gets to the end of the world, uh, end of the, end of the wall, I'm like an angel. <laughs> Telomerase comes in and adds that brick. It's a whole new enzyme. And it's only found in our reproductive cells. So every time our cells divide, our telomeres get a little bit shorter, telomerase then relengthens it. Okay. The way that my company is trying to find ways to lengthen telomeres, we're using two different approaches. One is called gene induction, and the other one's called gene delivery. <coughs> Let me talk first about gene induction. Now, telomerase is an enzyme, and it's encoded by a gene shown here in blue. The telomerase gene is like any other gene on the chromosomes. We have like uh, 25,000 different genes on our chromosomes. Telomerase is just one of them. And so what genes do is it produces proteins, stuff like that, in a more complicated way than shown here. But it, it produces proteins and other things that assist in the function of the cell. The gray bar going across is, is part of the chromosome. Now, next to every gene, there's a regulatory element. This is like a light switch. Light switch, turn the lights on and off. I want you to think of this as a dimmer switch, though. The regulatory elements are dimmer switch, and most genes in our body, in our cells, have the ability to turn on and off, just like a gene switch. Now, in our reproductive cells, this gene is turned on. There's nothing that's turning off. This light switch is turned on to probably close to maximum. In every other cell of our body, there's a protein that binds to that regulatory element and shuts the gene off. And as a result, we don't produce telomerase in 99.99% .99 of our cells, and that's why they get shorter as we go. <coughs> that protein is called a repressor. My company is doing is we've developed assays that are simple to do assays, expensive but simple to do, that we can test different chemicals for their ability to bind to that repressor and dislodge it. Shown as a as green thing there. So we are searching for things that will cause that to be dislodged and turn the gene on. And again, think of it as a dimmer switch. Some of these green little objects are going to turn it on more than others. So this is our robotic systems. We have two robots. Uh, they don't look like humanoid robots, but they're, they're machines called robots that actually do this screening. We can test up to 4,000 different chemicals a day. Chemicals are natural products. And this is kind of a history of our drug and natural product screening. We call it high throughput screening because the robot can do things really fast. This is, so this chart is showing year at the bottom and on the upper axis is showing percent telomerase. We identified a long time ago, how much telomerase do you need inside of a cell to stop telomere shortening? Remember I showed you it was a tug of war? Well, how much do you need on both sides to stop this type of uh, telomere shortening? So we, know, so we call that 100%. 100% means if you produce enough telomerase to be called 100%, you have stopped telomere shortening. 
when we started our test, we first found very low level things. And then, then probably around 2007, we'd had enough that we were able to now optimize the assay and make, um, make the assay work more efficiently. And as a result, we were able to test for things at a more efficient rate and get better answers. So up until about 2008, that happened. Now, we discovered our very first telomerase inducer that was stronger than any of the natural products. In uh, uh, about 2006, a little time after 2006, we called it C0057684 because that was the 57,684th thermal group test. Okay, so this is, that was only the beginning. So we kept on going. <clears throat> By around 2008, we discovered something that was even a lot, lot stronger, and our strongest ever so far. And it's called C0314818 because it was our 314,818th thermal group test. It, that also goes by the name of CAM818, and a lot of you might have heard that because it's, well, it's actually licensed to another company that's actually marketing it now. So, before 2008, we tested 30, 350,000 compounds, and we found 900 different chemicals that would induce telomerase. The highest one was the CAM818. We also tested over 10,000 natural products, and we found 39 hits. I can tell you, the natural products have never worked as well as the synthetic. And unfortunately, even though if you're a big fan of natural products, if we take the natural product and modify it to make it better, it's no longer natural, and it becomes a pharmaceutical. So we can't make the, the natural products better, but we can make the synthetic ones better and what's more important is we can make them safer. Okay, right now, every chemical that we discover is of no value to us unless we can prove it's safer than the three toxicity tox positive controls, which are ginger, resveratrol, and uh, ginseng. Those three, which are considered pretty safe, any synthetic drug that we come up with that we think might be testing in humans, we want to make certain they're safer than those before we even start any testing. So oh, our screening cost about $1 million a month, and that's what we were doing, a very expensive screening protocol up until about 2008. And if we continued that, we figured we'd be at 100 by around 2013, 2014. 100, remember, will stop telling the show. If we continued at the same rate we were going, we would have had something that was, that was a score of 100 and stopped telling the shortening by four, four or five years ago. And then we could have continued and gone way beyond that, which means we'll start lengthening telomeres. And the theory is that when we start doing that, we will start seeing people get younger, and we'll see uh, declining health reversed, and a lot of really positive things come in, in health-related issues. And unfortunately, this is what happened because of the global financial crisis of 2008. All of our investors lost the ability to fund anymore, and we've been struggling ever since, just trying to find ways to keep in existence. And, and Bill can talk about that. Bill's been one of the major people trying to help find companies like mine and others find funding and stuff like that. There's got a lot of studies that he's trying to raise money to support. I encourage everybody to help Bill Falloon help us. Okay, so it's been, it's been pretty dismal since about 2008. But we did find some things. So again, what, what I'm going to show right now, and it's, this has got a red box around it because these are the things you want to do. These aren't all of our discoveries. Okay? I just want to tell you, when anybody ever announces that they have something that induces telomerase in human cells, my, my lab tests it. We want to verify that it works. Okay? And so things that work are TA65, sold by a company called TA Sciences. That's their website. I hear this is being recorded, so you can, if you don't want to write these things down, you can... I'll watch the videos later. <clears throat> um, this is the very first telomerase inducer ever discovered. Uh, I was actually at Geron Corporation when we realized that uh, this plant called astragalus root had something in it. But I left because uh, the company was saying, quit working on that, focus on cancer research instead. I left and started Sierra Sciences about that. But the scientists that stayed there finished on TA65, uh, licensed it to a company called TA Sciences, and then Geron refused to do any more work on it. The TA Sciences worked with us 
to actually do a lot of the work to characterize the PA65 was the real McCoy. It was the very first thing that ever could be shown to actually induce telomerase expression. Since then, uh, there's also been a product called Isogenesis, showed by a company called Isogenics. I should say, okay, TA65, we get no kickback. <clears throat> I'm going to say this product and the next product, my company does get a royalty from it, but it all goes towards funding our research because of the fact that it's hard to find investors right now. We need some source of funding to fund our research. So Isogenics provides us with funding for our research, and that's how we can exist right now. So their company is www.isogenics.com. And then there's TAM818, which I mentioned before is not a natural product. This is now a synthetic product. It's sold by a company called Defy Time, and their website is defytimer.com. Not defytime.com, it's defytimer.com. But these are things that people are trying to find ways of keeping the, or lengthening their telomeres. And I'm going to explain in a minute that <laughs> they actually don't get longer, but I'll explain why in a minute. These are the only three things that we have ever tested. And you, if you've heard of it, you can guarantee we've tested it, that we've ever been able to show that actually does work, uh, reduce telomerase and lengthen telomeres. And then, I'm, again, I want you to get your telomeres lengths measured before you get on these things. And then get it, measure them several times to actually see if your rate of telomere shortening is decreasing or getting longer. Okay. The problem is, is that all these ones that I just listed are like this in that tug of war. You still have two people, if you're, if you're leading a super healthy lifestyle, you still have two people pulling to shorten. The telomerase inducer is only putting one person on the lengthening side. The net result is you're still losing the tug of war with these products, but you're losing it slower. So maybe in 30, 40 years from now, we're going to start seeing some people are going to exceed this theoretical maximum lifespan of 125 years by, by slowing down the rate of their telomere shortening. But they might have to do other things in addition to that. Okay, <clears throat> that's all of everything about gene uh, uh, induction. Now let me go to the subject of gene delivery because this has actually been working a lot better and it's been working great for 20 plus years now. I want to explain gene delivery in a way that's not commonly said. Scientists tend to use scary words, which aren't actually true, but I'm going to explain it in a way that's not so scientific. I want you to think of a human cell like a soap bubble, okay? It really is a soap bubble. Now, this, this, by the way, this gene delivery is also called gene therapy. Whenever you hear about gene therapy, this is what that means, this gene delivery, a way of delivering a gene. Instead of Inducing the gene that's already inside your cells, deliver a new gene to the cell. Okay, for this analogy, I want you to imagine that you have blue eyes. So inside that, in the, inside the eye cells, you're producing, you're producing a lot of blue pigment. But you want green eyes. Okay, you don't like blue eyes. You want green eyes. So you get this smaller soap bubble. And inside that soap bubble, you have a gene, a green eye. And as we all know, because we were all kids blowing soap bubbles, when two soap bubbles come in contact with each other, they fuse. And that gene gets put inside the cell. Now, that cell, that gene, then produces green eye pigment. And what's nice about gene therapy is it produces a lot of this green pigment. A lot of the gene. You have these... Remember the genes, all genes are controlled by these on-off switches, like dimmer switches. Whenever you do gene therapy, you try to put that, put that switch on the maximum. So you can produce a lot of green. This is how we could theoretically give everybody here who had blue eyes that didn't want them green eyes. That, that technology exists today, but it's still in clinical studies and stuff like that. So it's not going to be readily available for another five, ten years. Okay, I want you to describe gene therapy or gene delivery is divided into several components. First, we call the, that small, smaller, smaller soap bubble the vehicle. It's what's going to carry the gene into the cell. Inside, that DNA molecule that's inside is called the payload. The vehicle is carrying the payload into the cell, which is the destination. That's what gene therapy is. Okay. <clears throat> now, the vehicle, I said gene therapy has been around for 20, 30 years, or maybe even longer. 
problem is, is that most of the vehicles used for gene therapy have toxic side effects all in themselves. Okay. So right now, the type of gene therapy that we're using, which is brand new, called AAV, there's been now 113 clinical studies done using an AAV gene therapy vehicle to deliver not polymerase, but other genes, or not green eyes, but other genes to the body. And every one of them has been shown to be safe. The only problem that's occurred is that some people have an immune response to that gene therapy. And so as soon as it gets inside the blood, it's completely destroyed. It doesn't cause any health problems, but it means that those people can't be treated with this gene therapy. I am actually, and we do have a clinical study underway, I'm going to say it now, but I am looking for a strong immunologist to help us solve this problem. So if anybody can make any recommendations, I'm already talking to Dr. Dipmarine Maharaj, who works with Bill Fluon about this, and he's so busy with other clinical studies, I don't know if he's going to have time. We need to find somebody to work with us that can really help us solve this problem because I don't want to tell a 95-year-old person that wants to be in the clinical study that can make that person live longer and healthier. I don't want to tell that person, I'm sorry, you can't because you already have an immune response. That would be pretty disappointing. I want to find a way to get everybody to be treated. But it's not going to affect the clinical study. Okay, so <clears throat> the payload in our case is the telomerase gene. We telomerase gene inside a small cell bubble. And this telomerase gene, through, once it's been delivered, a lot of systems for the last 20 years have shown there's problems with the delivery, but once it gets delivered, it causes no side effects, negative side effects whatsoever. It only does good things to the cell. So the telomerase gene has a really good scientific reputation of being very good for you. Okay, so inside the human telomerase gene, it's delivered just like everything else, and when it gets in there, it produces telomerase. And as before, it produces a lot of telomerase. And this is why we can find telomeres get really long. In fact, remember the tug of war? It produces so much telomerase inside the cells that we have 30 people pulling the length versus two people to short. This is, this is way beyond what we need to actually reverse aging and declining health. This is something that could really, really be great. And <clears throat> I want to show a few examples of using gene therapy. Not all of them are AAV. I don't want to call these proof of concept. I've crossed out proof. I want to call them support of concept because I don't believe, as I showed you when I was talking about the sticks of dynamite, that everything that works in mice is going to work in humans. And everything that's going to work in a Petri dish is going to work in humans. The only way to get proof of concept is to actually treat humans. And that's what we want to do, and that's what to, 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 get, to make certain that we have been not wasting our last 25 years. We've got to get these tested in humans. Okay, so the first study back in 1998, when I was still at Geron Corporation, we showed that we could exceed the Hayflick limit. Hayflick limit is when you take human cells and grow it in a petri dish. This, is, this graph is showing the number of days in the culture in the bottom and the number of cell, times a cell can divide. Cells will divide and divide and divide, and we find that human cells quit growing after a while. They reach a stage called senescence, which may or may not be associated with aging, but there's a, long, a lot of theories that it's very connected to the aging process. Well, we found out that the gene therapy back in 1998 actually abolished that Hayflick limit. When we treated cells with the polymerase gene therapy, we were able to exceed that Hayflick limit. Also, this is now a paper where uh, after I left Geron Corporation, other scientists took human skin cells, grew them on the back of a mouse, and then treated that human skin. And what they did is they had mice, they had young or old uh, skin cells transplanted. Some were treated with telomerase and some weren't. The ones that were treated with telomerase actually became young again in every way imaginable. And <clears throat> they also behaved young in every way imaginable too. So, so this was really exciting stuff. This was done in the year 2000, not too long after that first study was done. So this is where there's been data around for a long time saying that delivering telomerase by gene therapy works. But remember, gene therapy was actually the therapy itself, not the telomerase gene, but the therapy itself was causing such bad things happen to these mice that would never be tested on humans by that gene therapy. These mice were also looked at uh, biomarkers of aging and found out that every single one of them got reversed. 
old cells became young again on the skin in every way imaginable. Then back in about 2010, Dr. Rhonda Pennell at Harvard actually treated old mice. She took old mice, put the gene in every one of their cells using gene therapy, and found that they got young again. This is, this is the Nature News uh, announced telomerase reverses the aging process. Uh, <clears throat> there were several things that we saw happen. We saw telomeres get longer, uh, fertility came back, spleen size came back, sense of smell came back. Their brain sizes got bigger, both, and their function increased, improved. And there was a threefold survival in, in, in after only 25 weeks, just by lengthening the telomeres in old mice. What I want to show for just a few minutes, I think it's a three minute video, and Diane Sawyer interviewing news. Dr. Ronda Pell. a cage around the corner? News tonight of a breakthrough for some pioneering mice. But we always wonder, what does a fountain of youth for rodents reveal for humans? Here's Sharon Alfonsi reporting. In the movie Cocoon, it's a swimming pool that turns back the clock for a group of senior citizens. But now, researchers have found a way not just to stop, but reverse the aging process. The key is something called a telomere. We all have them. They're the tips or caps of your chromosome, seen here in yellow. This is what it looks like in a young adult. But as you grow older, the telomeres become damaged and frayed. And as they stop working, we start aging. <clears throat> experiencing things like hearing and memory loss. Scientists took mice who were prematurely aged, added an enzyme, and essentially turned their telomeres back on. You can see it before the enzyme, after. Their brain function improved, their fertility was restored. It was a, a remarkable uh, reversal of the aging process. Look at this picture. The mouse on the right has bad skin, gray hair, and is balding. The one on the left had its telomeres flipped back on. And you could see that uh, essentially you now have a dark coat color, uh, that the hair uh, is restored, that the coat ha has a nice healthy sheen to it. Even more dramatic, the change in brain size. This is before. The mice had 75% of a normal brain, like a patient with severe Alzheimer's. But after the telomeres were reactivated, the brain returns to normal size. As for humans, while it is just one factor, I'm sure scientists I've gone over now time, say so I'm going to cut this short. That's all the data. But lengthening telomeres by gene therapy did several things. One, as I showed before, it abolished the hay flick limit. It reversed aging and declining health in skin grown on the back of a mouse, of human skin grown on the back of a mouse. And it also reversed aging and declining health in old mice, as you just saw in this video. No other theory on aging has ever done any of this. The only exception is, is parabiosis, which is one of the things Bill Falloon's working with. <clears throat> this has actually been demonstrated to reverse aging in mice too. But so far, there's a, still an, a question as to what theory is actually being tested. Okay, we know that, that when you take young cells from young blood and put it into old uh, mice with, um, so essentially it's, it's taking young blood and put it into old mice, and the mice get age reversal very, very reproducibly. There is a possibility, and I think a strong possibility, that this is all because you're providing those mice with young cells that have long telomeres. So telomeres could possibly still be playing a role here, but we don't know. But I'd be interesting because we, we don't, I don't think anybody really knows what theory is being tested with parabiosis, but who cares <laughs> if it works? So I'm really excited about that, and Dr. Dipnarine Maharaj, who I was hoping would be here tonight, he's actually the lead scientist in doing this research. Okay, so I have an announcement. Telomerase gene therapy clinical trial is now getting started. We licensed our gene therapy, our safe gene therapy, to a company called Labella Gene Therapeutics. And their website is labellagt.com. It's short for Labella Gene Thera Therapeutics. Their primary focus is Alzheimer's disease. They're going to be using our gene therapy to try to treat Alzheimer's disease. There are several methods delivery, some of them shown here, interthecal and IV and, and several different ways of delivering the gene therapy to the body. But it's not just Alzheimer's disease, and I'm going to show you in a minute, there's a lot of different things that we could be doing, or that they could be doing. I say we a lot because I feel, I feel I own this technology, but they've licensed it from me, so it's their project now. But this is, the problem is it's going to be large-scale production, and it's not going to be cheap. 
actually, it turns out when we estimate how much it costs my lab to produce enough of this gene therapy to treat one person once, it costs us millions of dollars to do that. So this is not going to be something that everybody can afford. Okay, so don't start thinking everybody can start doing this as soon as, as, soon as it gets into clinical studies or, or proven to work. So why are we doing this? My goal isn't to make it make only the wealthy people younger. My goal in life is to make everybody younger and healthier and stuff like that. There's two reasons why I want to pursue this. And one is proof of concept. Before I called it support a concept, this would be a great proof of concept. My mission, I want to see Betty White walk out on stage, look, feel, and behave 25 again. And I believe there's a chance. But there might be other things we have to do too, as I've already said. But I, I, at least let's get this one component of aging solved that we know of, and that's telomere shortening. So proof of concept, that's very exciting, even though it's going to cost millions of dollars to treat somebody. The other thing, this is going to be another way of funding my gene induction. I told you before that terminated essentially in 2008 because of the global financial crisis. This is going to allow us to get funding from these wealthy people getting younger. We'll get funding to come up with this cheaper chemical approach that would do the same thing, but everybody would be able to afford it. And the good news is Labella knows exactly that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to try to put them out of business as soon as I start getting funding from the royalties they're going to provide us. And, and they're all for it, so that's good news. The clinical study is going to be right now done in Cartagena, Colombia. I've been there a few times now, met with the doctors, the clinics, and everything like that. Everything's getting set up really well. I just before I get into more, I just want to ask, is telomerase gene therapy safe? And I want to say that now, at least on by last uh, November 28, 2017, there have been 108 clinical studies using this, what's called AAV, gene therapy. Every study said it's safe. The only problem is they saw that some people had an immune response and so they couldn't be treated, okay? And that depressed a lot of those people. <clears throat> but even if it was a little bit dangerous, I got a really common th thing that we got to discuss here. When is the risk from not being treated greater than risk of being treated? I mean, aging is a high risk of death, okay? Even if there was a little risk from treatment, it's it might even be lower than what it causes if you don't get treated. This is something we got to think about when we think about doing these clinical studies. I, my goal isn't to call, kill a bunch of people using a gene therapy that might kill them. My goal is to not kill them, not kill them from not being treated by regular aging. Now, there's been studies down showing that if you are a healthy, not just a regular 89-year-old, you're a healthy 89-year-old, you have an 11% chance of dying in the next year. Okay, I can guarantee, without doing any studies, that this gene therapy is a lot safer than that. So just being 89 untreated, you have an 11% chance of dying. If I told you you had an 11% chance of dying by being treated, you would never do that. But this is what it's going to be if you don't get treated. I believe this, that actually the risk is going to be down in the point something percent, very, very low. Then there's other ages, 61% chance of being 95, 89% chance of living to be 100. This is from, the, the reference for that is right there below. I didn't do that study myself. Um, but again, and it's also not just aging. Labella is going to look at a lot of different things. And I already showed this slide, but there's a lot of different things. I, I, I'm excited about, like, where is it? Uh, uh, degenerative disc disease. This is going to be, a lot of people, when they get older, their discs start shrinking, dehydrating. Bulging, getting out, you know, they, they get shorter and everything like that. This is something we can just inject into each disc, the gene therapy, and lengthen the telomeres. And animal studies have shown that lengthening telomeres in disc actually restores them, rejuvenates them. So this is something that I'm looking forward to them doing as soon as they get done or started or finished with the Alzheimer study. But there's a lot of different diseases here that could be treated just by gene therapy. Again, we don't know if there's going to be more that's needed, but let's, let's get rid of this one obstacle we know exists, which is telomere shortening. Okay, when? When is this clinical study going to be done? Well, I really can't say. It's not my company that's doing it. It's Labella Gene Therapeutics. I am helping them and consulting for them. There's a lot of obstacles you have to go through, but guess what? 
They're, because it's millions of dollars to produce enough to treat one person once, they are having problems raising the funding too, just like everybody else. So this is slowing things down. I used to say they'd have the first person treated before the end of 2017. Well, that was over three months ago. Now I'm saying they're going to have somebody treated before the end of 2018. <clears throat> this is, again, their website to learn more. Uh, my, my, my website's really not going to have that information, but Labella Gene Therapeutics, labellagt.com is where to go. To learn more about telomere biology in general, because there's so much to say. I didn't have time to say half of it. I think I went over time anyway. There's so much to say. I didn't cover half of what I should have talked about today. But go to my website. And you can learn a lot more by watching two of my videos. Uh, one is my Tokyo presentation. I don't know if the text is too small. The one on the far left there, Tokyo presentation, where I spent, went into a lot of details at a medical conference. And there's another one, last Rad Festival, where I talked a lot, of, a lot of stuff. And I also have three books. Two of them I already showed you right here. I don't have any to sell or give away today, but they're all available on Amazon.com. Now, one of the things that I, maybe a lot of people were hoping I would talk about today, if I can get the slides, does telomerase cause cancer? That's a big subject uh, that some people believe I can right now say it's all hearsay. There's no data whatsoever. Nobody's ever put telomerase into a cell and saw it become a cancer cell. It just doesn't happen, but there's still a lot of hearsay, a lot of belief that this does happen. I have addressed this in great detail in my Tokyo presentation. If you, wanna, don't, if you don't wanna listen to the whole thing, uh, you just watch from 25, 25 minutes, all the way up to an hour and one minutes, 55 seconds. It's over half an hour of me just going through all the reasons why. This medical audience, before the talk, I ask them how many believe telomerase will cause cancer. About 25% of the people in that room raised their hands. When I got done, I said, okay, how many still believe it? Nobody raised their hands. Okay, there, it's, it's, there's no data, it's all hearsay, and it's actually going to decrease the risk of cancer, not increase it. You can also go read my book, Telomer, uh, Telomer Lengthening, uh, on pages 64 to 77, I address this in great detail. Because if I went over this, it would take me half an hour just to talk about that subject, and probably an hour. But that's where you can get that information. Uh, you can also watch the movie The Immortalist, it's, as Alex was first mentioning at the beginning. Uh, it stars me and Aubrey de Grey. <clears throat> and uh, uh, there's a website right up there where you can get it or go to Netflix, as uh, Alex was saying. And then Radfest. Anybody who really wants to live healthy for as long as possible wants to go to the revolution against aging and death. RAD stands for the revolution against aging and for death. It's not a conference, it's a festival. It's the most incredible thing I've ever seen where there's great scientific presentations intermixed with entertainment and stuff. You will not be bored at this. And the next one's coming up, as it was said September 21st, but it's actually September 20th, 20th to 23rd. 2018, and go to radfest.com uh, to uh, uh, sign up for it and learn more about it. So thank you very much. Any questions? I do believe I went way over time. Right. But I, I'm, I'm going to be here until the last person leaves answering any questions anybody has. But there is one hand raised over very there. Very good. So much, thank Dr. You. Bill uh, Andrews. Let's a warm uh, thank you so much. Um, we only have time for two questions. I see a hand up uh, here in the front. Uh, if one other person has a question, please make it a question. Uh, we can save comments for afterwards. As Dr. Andrews mentioned, he will be dining with us uh, yes. this evening, so we can all fellowship and talk more. This then. is my favorite thank part: you. is the Q and A. Does resveratrol lengthen telomeres? And then, if so, how much wine should I drink at night? <laughs> Unfortunately, resveratrol has no effect on telomere lengths, even though there's publications saying one way or the other. But uh, um, drink all the wine you can because l drinking destroys liver cells. The reason is is because your liver cells get killed from the alcohol, but that's okay when you're young because other cells divide and replace those cells. But through all the extra divisions that you have to go through to repair the damaged cells from the alcohol, telomeres get shorter and shorter. And then after several years of drinking a lot, your telomeres get so short they can no longer divide to replace those cells. But, but when our telomerase gene therapy or the chemicals will come out, will solve that problem. So drink all you want. <laughs> yes, there's no other question back. Yes, 
uh, two NASA astronauts, uh, yes. Scott and Mark uh, Kelly. Yes. Uh, Scott was in space for more on the space station for more than a year, yeah. and he came back, and his telomeres were longer than his identical twin. Yeah. Uh, so I can tell how, you. How I, can you explain that? Um, Susan Bailey is the lead scientist in that study, and I've been communicating with her a lot. Uh, as I said, most telomere length measurement protocols, especially PCR, are very, very inaccurate. And that's what she did. And I don't believe any of that data, and she knows it, and I've discussed it back and forth, and she didn't know it, but they're still promoting it. I'm, I'm just surprised that press releases just came out, but it's been two years now since he got back. Press releases just came out a, a few weeks ago saying his telomeres got longer. But I don't believe it. And they say they're now going to have peer-reviewed studies published that haven't even been submitted yet. Peer-reviewed studies published in 2018, but I don't believe those studies will ever get accepted. I think there's real flaws in the data, and I have seen some of that data. Yes, and I, you know, if anybody wants to watch a really good YouTube video, it's called What's Real and What's Not Real. And it's a YouTube video that I did it's the most viral video I've ever had where I spend the entire time just telling you how to find out what's real. Is coffee good for you or bad for you? Is diet soda good for you or bad for you? Is eggs good for you or bad for you? It's how to go and find the real good studies and stay away from the hearsay, the press releases. They're all wrong. Okay, go to the scientific peer-reviewed studies. Okay, so there's no more questions? Uh, yes, thank you. That's okay. it. Thank I'll you be so around. Much. Thanks. All right. Uh, thank you, folks. Again, real quick, a couple of announcements before we uh, dine tonight. Again, we've got a, a delicious tilapia dinner. We've got uh, some uh, meatballs as well as a tuna ceviche. A couple of quick announcements, if you don't mind staying put. Very briefly, we've got the World uh, Tai you. Chi Gong Day is yes. coming up on Saturday, April 28th. Uh, that's starting at Somebody 10 a.m. Here, here at the Church of Perpetual Life. We're doing the World Qi Gong Day. Uh, so that's a half-hour class. Every uh, half hour features uh, medical and martial Qigong forms. Uh, that's with uh, Jeffrey, our very own. Uh, so you can learn more at worldtaichiday.org. There's flyers downstairs. Um, and actually, this last announcement, um, not to kind of uh, change the dynamic of the room, but if I can actually just get a, a couple of moments, a quick moment, very briefly, of silence. I actually have uh, some solemn news uh, to share um, with you all this evening. There was a uh, posting made by a, a friend of mine uh, who I've had the pleasure of meeting a few times uh, that he's come down uh, for various events over the last few years. Matthew Deutsch. Whoops, sorry. Okay, yes. Um, he posted on Facebook, uh, if you've ever met Matthew Deutsch, a young cryonicist, an activist in this movement. Uh, his mother recently... Um, Past. And so he posted on Facebook, we wanted to just share it with uh, you guys tonight. He said, yesterday my mother, Linda Schwab Deutsch, completed her computer-controlled cool-down at the Cryonics Institute and was encapsulated. She is their 159th patient. She had terminal cancer of her cerebrospinal fluid ducts and liver and had a prognosis of death. Thanks to collaborative efforts, though, she... Dehydrate, she escaped erasure with little more than a few prionized proteins, thermal stress fractures, and dehydration as side effects of vitrification, and no metabolism. Hashtag freeze all the things, hashtag the fucking future, hashtag resleeving, hashtag altered carbon. Um, so that was Matthew's uh, notification to his friends and family about that news. Uh, Neil um, kindly responded with these words, uh, from all of us here at the Church of Perpetual Life, Matthew, I keep you and your family in my thoughts and prayers. Have faith that through future successes in the scientific research pursuit of cryonic suspension and reanimation, that you will see her again in the future. Matthew, don't just want this. Have the faith so deep that you know this is the future for her. And, um, of course, if anybody is uh, struggling with these uh, types of issues of, of death in the family, if there's anything uh, you want to reach out to us for help and support, that's what we're here for. And, again... Let your friends and family know about cryonics. It's the best shot we've got uh, beyond uh, making it uh, to see that day here uh, physically. So um, thank you again for being here. We appreciate uh, your attendance, and we look forward to chatting with you more downstairs. Thanks again, everybody. We ho hope to see you next month.
Tomei. Catch you all dot live.